Next talk is by Dr. P.C. Gupta, Venus Interventions, How and When to Perform. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, Venus Intervention is an area which is uh, slowly now gaining ground with more and more people taking interest in this. Uh, veins have been neglected even by the vascular surgeons earlier. The indications where one might want to intervene are acute and chronic. Acute being deep vein thrombosis and prevention of pulmonary embolism. And then chronic venous disease, in which include varicose veins and venous occlusions, uh, more specifically the iliac veins. Uh, deep vein thrombosis, the treatment options are anticoagulation, catheter guided thrombolysis, pharmacomechanical thrombolysis, or surgical thrombectomy. Uh, the uh, previous ACCP guidelines now do recommend catheterized thrombolysis in patients with iliac vein thrombosis. And in patients where catheter-guided thrombolysis is not feasible, a surgical thromb thrombectomy is preferred. The rationale for clot removal is that chronic venous disease, which occurs due to reflux and obstruction and endothelial dysfunction, clot removal is likely to preserve patency, likely to preserve valve function, and also endothelial function. And this can happen even up to 10 to 14 days following the deep vein thrombosis. And this, if we are able to remove the clot, it should result in a reduced risk of chronic venous disease. And these are some examples of uh, the first one, the up upper picture is showing uh, thrombolysis and the lower one, an IVC thrombus where a surgical thrombectomy has been done. Uh, what, uh, what we have seen with our experience, it works best within a week of onset of deep vein thrombosis. Access, we usually try to use the ipsilateral popliteal or superficial femoral vein, punctured under ultrasound guidance. Uh, sometimes the contralateral femoral vein or the internal jugular vein. And the agents that can be used are streptokinase, urokinase or TPA. Uh, moving on to prevention of uh, pulmonary embolism. Vena cable filters may be temporary or permanent and excellent modality if used judiciously. Uh, if used uh, without scruples, then uh, we are looking at a higher rate of complications, especially when used in young patients. The absolute indications would be ongoing pulmonary embolism despite adequate anticoagulation and proximal DVT with contraindication to anticoagulation. And these are some of the filters that have been used. Uh, we do use temporary filters in situations where the contraindication is temporary. Uh, okay, now moving on to chronic venous disease. 80% of patients with lower limb ulcers have venous disease. The prevalence of chronic venous disease is between 2 and 9%. It's more prevalent in males. And when we see these patients, about 50% of the ulcers have been present for more than 12 months and 72% are recurrent. And it's not uncommon to see patients who've had their ulcers for over 10 years or even 15 years. Uh, to understand the pathophysiology of chronic venous disease, it basically, in three words, it's ambulatory venous hypertension. Normally, the muscle pumps in the foot, calf, and thigh, they return venous blood against gravity. On standing still, the pressure in the foot veins is about 90 millimeters of mercury. On walking, it falls to less than 30. This is in a normal situation. In patients with failure of muscle pump, failure of valves and or, or if there is outflow obstruction, the ambulatory venous pressure is high and this is what results in either edema or lipodermatosclerosis or venous ulceration. Uh, clinical features, I think I just mentioned these, the swelling and then skin changes, presence of ecological factor, we can see varicose veins or there may be a history of DVT, uh, presence of pain or ache or heaviness and then venous claudication. And these are some examples of, uh, you can see mild lipodermatosclerosis, very severe, frank venous ulcer, edema, and varicose veins in this slide. And a Duplay finding, we find significant reflux in patients with the varicose veins. This is at the saphenofemoral junction. For varicose veins, we are tending to move towards endovenous procedures from open surgery. And why we prefer endovenous procedures, or more than us, actually the patients prefer endovenous procedures, uh, it's non-surgical. And a lot of patients are comfortable with the idea of a non-surgical procedure. 
um, ease of performance, it's a very sort of, uh, it's not a steep learning curve. It's very easy for the operator to learn these procedures. Cosmetically superior to open surgery. They have comparable or better outcomes. Uh, better options than redo groin surgery in patients with recurrent varicose veins. Patients do return early to work. It's an outpatient procedure and as I said, very easy for the operator to learn. Uh, the procedures available to us are endovenous laser, radiofrequency ablation. These two procedures are ultrasound guided. Uh, we use a percutaneous puncture under ultrasound guidance. Uh, the catheter is passed to below the saphenofemoral junction. Uh, usually we keep it below the inferior epigastric vein. We inject tumescent anesthesia, so the procedures are under local anesthesia. And there is thermal injury to the vein wall which results in an aseptic phlebitis and thrombosis. And then we have uh, foam sclerotherapy. Sorry, I'm not able to run the video or I can. Here you'll just see the needle entering and the foam which runs into the vein. It, it causes immediate vasospasm and then results in thrombosis of the vein. Uh, this is the device that we have in a hospital for radiofrequency ablation and this is the probe that the radiofrequency catheter which is used goes through a seven French sheath and basically you heat the vein, withdraw the catheter and the vein is collapsed. Uh, this is what we have a 980 uh, endovenous laser. Uh, we are not using much of it because it causes uh, significant post-operative pain. A better device is the 1470 laser, also called the pain-free laser, uh, much more patient friendly. Uh, there are two types of laser fibers, the jacketed fiber and the 360 radial fiber. And here you can see the catheter position just below the saphenofemoral junction. Uh, the outcomes with endovenous procedures, over 96% technical success, can be difficult in patients who have tortuous long saphenous veins. Uh, the vein closure rates of, are about 90 to 98% at one year. There is more patient comfort compared to open surgery. Long-term results uh, are comparable or similar to surgery. And with foam sclerotherapy, we see higher recanalization rates. So I personally prefer to use foam only for branch varices or residual varices. And for the main veins, I use radiofrequency ablation or endovenous laser ablation. Complications uh, can be in the form of DVT and pulmonary embolism. DVT, especially when uh, I, I know of some operators do not use, who do not use ultrasound and they may end up injuring the saphenofemoral junction. Uh, there can be vein perforation, more with laser compared to radiofrequency ablation, phlebitis, hematoma, infection, pigmentation, nerve injury, especially when we ablate veins in the lower part of the leg where the saphenous nerve runs very close to the vein and skin burns, again commoner with laser. And this is an example of a large echomotic patch seen after endovenous laser. Uh, moving on to the last uh, part of this talk, chronic venous disease in patients with normal long and short saphenous veins. 10 to 30% of patients with chronic venous disease have outflow obstruction, usually in the iliac veins. And these patients present either with venous ulcers or lipodermatosclerosis. Uh, the superficial veins are either normal or dilated but do not show reflux. They may or may not have give history of deep vein thrombosis and venography will often show iliac venous disease. However, in certain pati some patients, uh, the venography may be normal and you may require IVUS, which is far more sensitive in picking up these iliac vein lesions. What we see on the left, this is a normal MR venography showing the lower IVC and the iliac veins. And here we see a tight stenosis at the junction of the common iliac vein with the IVC. And this is the patient in which uh, balloon dilatation is being done. Uh, uh, sorry, this stent has been placed. This is without the contrast. The image has been taken. Uh, results of this venous stenting. Uh, in a series of 429 patients, there was 33% 30, of patients had edema reduction. 50% had pain relief and 55% had ulcer healing. The primary patency of these stents was 75% at three years. In another series of 982 patients, 
Patency rates were 79. This is uh, primary, assisted primary and secondary patency rates of 79, 100 and 100% for non-thrombotic iliac vein disease. And 57%, 80% and 86% for thrombotic disease or iliac vein disease following deep vein thrombosis. And there was improved quality of life in all categories of patients. The last segment of patients where we would intervene for veins would be patients who are on hemodialysis and have uh, venous, who require or have venous access. Uh, this is a patient who has a graft uh, which is attached to the, uh, to the axillary vein and there is a tight stenosis here at the anastomosis and this is following a stent. Another patient who had an AV fistula on the right arm had significant edema and venography, we tend to do a MR venography in these patients uh, and this is during the procedure we find a tight stenosis at the subclavian vein just where it joins the brachiocephalic vein and this is following a stent placed in that location. This by and large sums up what I would want to tell you about the interventions in venous disease. It's a very interesting field, a little more complex compared to arteries and uh, I'm sure it's a field which is going to grow more and more. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, uh, SVC uh, obstructions, intrinsic venous abnormalities, the stenting is really the rewarding. The patients will have the immediate symptoms. Of course, cancer related doesn't have it. And uh, most of these cases, uh, left iliacs, iliac vein uh, obstructions are very common. And uh, at the origin, the stenosis is common. So once we do the uh, catheter uh, thrombolysis, we should check for the underlying the stenosis and the stenting that will be the much more helpful yeah. to prevent the subsequent episodes Absolutely. of that. Absolutely, I agree with you. Thank you.